your uh, head is about to explode, I'm sure, but um, you are, uh, all of you are guinea pigs, you know that. This is the first time we've done anything uh, on this scale, and uh, you are part of the experiment. So far, the experiment has been successful, Amen. and uh, I don't know about you, I've heard a number of people uh, kind of confirm my, uh, my suspicions or my expectations, I guess, but um, everybody is saying that uh, everything has been first class and they've appreciated all of the information that has been dispensed, so I'm very grateful for that. Uh, I do have another handout for you. Uh, if our monitor would like to, uh, before she leaves us, would you like to uh, uh, help us out? This is called uh, Passing the Usability Test. And uh, it's just kind of uh, some supplementary material for you. Uh, my subject tonight, today will, uh, is on page 89 of your uh, syllabus. And uh, the diagram uh, was not accurate. So there are some changes that you may have to make to the, to the diagram uh, because of the different uh, headlines or titles of paragraphs uh, are just a little bit different. But uh, we will jump in and... Um, uh, and get started. But first of all, I'd like to say this, that um, somebody made a statement that what happens to you and has an emotional impact or has an emotional meaning is what you will remember most. For example, how many of you remember your first phone number when you were living at home? Amazing. Amazing. And no doubt, for some of you, that was a number of years ago. And you still remember that phone. I dare say you don't remember some of the other phone numbers you've had. But you remember that first one. Mine was back in the days when they used um, uh, words or names. So it was Melrose 7055. Now, I don't remember the crank. No, I, I, I don't go... <laughs> that far back. <laughs> uh, but uh, Melrose 7055, you remember those things. One of the things I remember about seventh grade typing class is that my teacher had a rule. Do not fiddle with the typing keys or the keyboard uh, after we say class uh, is uh, over. We're still in the room waiting for the bell to ring but no more touching the typewriter. And of course, what was I doing? Uh, I was... And so she uh, called me up front and said, uh, Mark, um, were you uh, touching the keyboard of the typewriter after we told you not to? I said, uh, yes, ma'am. And she said, uh, sit down. So I turned around to go back and said, Mark, come back up here. I said, yes. I, she said, I said, sit down. I said, okay. And I turned around to go back. She said, Mark, come back up here. She said, I said, sit down. Right here on the floor? Yes. Well, I was, uh, uh, I, I guess, too old to be called precocious, but um, maybe smart alecky or whatever. But I uh, said no, and she said, go to the office. So I went to the office, and the principal, who, uh, believe it or not, was not uh, expecting me, uh, of all people, to come and visit his office, being sent there by a teacher. And so he said, have a seat, Mark. And he said, uh, he asked me what happened, and so I told him, and he said, okay, I'll be back in a, in a minute. And uh, he left, and about 15, 20 minutes later, he came back and said, uh, okay. 
Sorry about that. Uh, he said, uh, you can go home. It was the last period of the day. You can go home now. Well, the whole, I didn't know what happened afterwards. But here's what I think happened. She was a first-year teacher. She was young. And she did not know that you do not humiliate a student, especially one as insecure as a 12- or 13-year-old uh, teen or preteen because at that age we are very sensitive and I never forgot that incident I never forgot that teacher's name Miss Johnson lo and behold I sat down on August 12th of this year at our 50th reunion I sat down next to Jim Johnson, who was Miss Johnson's younger brother, who happened to be in my class. And we, we were sitting at the same table, and I shared that little nugget, because, I mean, it was years and years later. No, I, I wasn't mad anymore. I was just laughing about it, and he got the biggest kick out of what his sister did when her, she was her first year of school. But you see, when you talk to somebody in an offensive way, when you attack them, when you um, insult them or say something disparaging to them, they never forget that. So be careful never to treat anyone disparagingly, regardless of who they are or what they do, because they will never forget it. And it might be something that they get revenge later on. I didn't do that, but uh, she has been the subject of my, uh, my uh, speeches on leadership from time to time, and uh, maybe a couple of my articles that I've written that I don't know that she's ever read. The uh, title of this particular uh, session is Creating an Environment of Growth Through Leadership Training. And there are three things I want to tell you, first of all, to get started about, about uh, the job of a teacher. Number one, teaching is not training. A teacher can uh, impart information. A teacher can help people to uh, understand things, and they can put the information out there. Once it's out there, then the teacher can be satisfied and walk away. Now, a good teacher will teach to the point of learning, but many teachers simply are happy with saying, I've told you it's your responsibility. You'll find that many college professors are that way. If you don't get it first time around, it's just too bad. Because they've, did, they've done their job, and now right. you are responsible for their information. But the second thing is coaching. Coaching is not training either. A coach motivates. A coach uh, helps. A, a coach tries to inspire. A coach encourages. Um, it's fun to teach for the teacher. I don't know of any teacher that absolutely hates to teach, or they'll find something else uh, some other way to, uh, to uh, dispense with their duties. But uh, it's fun for the teacher. It's fun for coaching because you feel like you're helping somebody. Training is the problem. Because training, a trainer has to get in the face of the trainee. A trainer has to be the bad guy. A trainer has to make people do what they don't want to do. The trainer, uh, in, a, in a sports uh, situation, for example, has to maybe make the phone call to get the person out of bed, get their carcass into the gym or uh, out on the track and running. And they hear all the guff, all the complaining, uh, all the whining, I don't want to do this, I hate you. Uh, and, but the trainer just lets it roll off his back, uh, it's all right, we got to do this. But guess what? 
at the end of the day, it's the trainer who has the greatest impact on the person, especially those who are in the military. Because many times soldiers will come back and say, the only reason I survived is because you trained me to the point where I could not get it out of my head. It was an automatic response, and I owe you my life. And so you may not have to be the bad guy. Maybe you want to appoint somebody else to be the really bad guy. But if you want to affect the change in your leadership and your leadership team, You've got to subject it all to this rigors, these rigors of training, yes. training, training. Yes. Don't be afraid to do that. So let's talk about the training program. Number one is your plan. You have to have a plan because you do get what you plan for. If you don't plan, you get, your, you, you get, you get uh, the results of not planning. You get hodgepodge. You get uh, helter-skelter, you get lackadaisical, you get whatever that you do not plan. A number of years ago, I was pastoring, or not pastoring, but uh, preaching a series of rallies for Sunday school uh, up in a certain district. Uh, I shouldn't have said up because it was somewhere between the Atlantic and Pacific, somewhere between the Canadian border and Mexico. Uh, and so... Um, I was talking to the, the uh, secretary of the Sunday School Department of that particular district, and I don't know what made me ask this question, but I, I said, do you have any water in your baptismal tank? He hung his head. He said, you know, we've been having some problems with, with our tank, and we don't have, I, I don't have any water in the tank right now, I'm sorry to say. I said, well, you don't have anybody to baptize because you don't have any water. And the reason you don't have any water in your tank is because you're not expecting to baptize anybody. And according to your faith, so be it. That was a Saturday. He went home that evening and put water in his tank. Monday morning, he called me and said, Brother Jordan, guess what? I said, I don't, I already know. You baptized somebody yesterday, didn't you? He said, you are right. I did. We put water in the tank, and guess what? God honored my faith. So if you don't plan to have revival, you don't need to plan. Just go business as usual. Just take what the day gives you and and forget about it. But you won't have the revival. It's not what you want to have. It's what you plan to have. You say, well, you can't plan the move of God. Well, why then did the uh, disciples, the 100 t- disciples, 120 disciples go into the upper room and wait there until the day of Pentecost? Now, that might have been, that was a, uh, I, I love to think about that because how many of you would stay in a room for 10 days? with nothing going on. Well, that's a whole separate uh, discussion. But they believed that something was going to happen. So therefore, their plans, they were simple, just go there to worship or whatever they did. And there was a great uh, outpouring of the Spirit of God. So you plan. Then what is your concept? What is your uh, training procedure? There is an old saying that Uh, function follows form. Now, some believe that it's the other way around, that form follows function. It's simply an architectural term that says if you will build a particular uh, building in a certain way, then it will function uh, according to that. Or some say, no, you, you look at the function of it, and then your architecture conforms to the function. I believe that your architecture or your uh, plan, your strategy for uh, your training program will follow the function. You create the architecture that suggests and that anticipates the desired action. 
major regret of builders is that they uh, start seeing the building used in a different way than it was originally intended. It happened to us. After we built our building on Sylvania Avenue, then we decided to have a daycare. Well, it was a major disruption. I even lost a family as a result of it because we had to commandeer a Sunday school room that that particular family was kind of in charge of. That was their territory. And when we moved into it with a daycare, uh, they were not happy. So it is, uh, it's difficult to change things afterwards. So make sure you know what you want to do and get the, get the ball rolling in that direction. And then the architecture will follow uh, that function. And when you don't really know what you want to do, then you have to be flexible. Uh, one of the greatest assets of a great leader is flexibility. You cannot always know exactly what's going to happen. And so you have to be able to be flexible and not rigid. I was in Florida uh, just last week, and I had to come up here to this conference. So uh, otherwise, we would have stayed down. And not only we were, were we in Florida, we were in South Florida, and I had a leadership seminar on Key Largo. So we were way down there, but that's where the hurricane came through. And there were many trees that are uprooted. I, we saw trees as we went down the, through the keys that were, were uprooted, and they would actually pull up the entire, uh, uh, all the turf around it, and the tree was leaning over or was laying on its side, and that great big patch of turf was with it, leaving a pretty good sized hole in the ground. Those trees died, but there were many palm trees that were still upright. And I asked Brother Mark Hadabaugh, what in the world? Why do those palm trees not? I can't believe it. They seem so, so uh, spindly and, and uh, they move and surely they would be the first ones. He said, no, because the trees that you see laying on their side, they would not bend. The palm trees are flexible. So when you design your, your training program, things may not go as well as you want them to, but be flexible. There are some questions you need to ask when you put this together. Uh, what is your overall goal? What do you really want to accomplish? And if you have a goal, then how will you know whether or not you meet your goal? Uh, if you don't know where you're going, then it really doesn't matter where you are. But if you really have a destination in mind, then you have to know where you are so that you can chart the course. Mm -hmm. So if you want to really chart a, a viable course and achieve a doable result, then you need to plan uh, or, or work in, incorporate an overall goal. What is your, are your intermediate goals uh, to establish en route? You know, we get so ex uh, excited about the end goal that we forget about intermediate goals. Mm -hmm. You cannot ch achieve step 10 if you overlook steps 2 through 9. Correct. 2 through 9 are not exciting. Steps two through nine just uh, sometimes are so discouraging and are so lackluster uh, that, that you may feel like dropping out because you want goal 10. You're never going to reach goal 10 until you work through the other goals. You're never going to get the kind of revival church, the kind of growth, the kind of outreach you want unless you're willing to start with one and two and three and back to two and back to one and then back to three and then to five and then back to three and back to two until you just keep on going. One of the great things, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard this before, about building a church is that you go through several sets of scaffolds mm -hmm. while you're building the church. 
so not everybody will stay with you, but there are some that will stay with you long enough so that you can, God would help you use their talents and their abilities and their contributions to get to the next level. Uh, who will this involve? And that's really why I gave you this uh, little additional handout, passing the usability test. Who are you going to, to use? And this also involves the second uh, or the next uh, point as well. Their, what is their age? What is their gender? What is their status? And so forth. Who do you need to be involved in this particular training uh, initiative? Uh, because you cannot uh, make somebody do what they are not equipped to do or what God has not called them to do. So let me just go over this uh, quickly, the usability test. Uh, first of all is ability. Do they have the ability? Um, if people don't have the ability to sing, don't put them up to sing. Uh, I don't care if the... I had a... I had a, a I think he might have been 55 at the time, a, a gentleman come to me uh, at the church and say, I want to go to Bible school. And I said, well, Howard, what do you want to teach or what do you want to take when you're at Bible school? He says, music. I said, Howard, can you sing? No. What instrument can you play? I, none. But I just feel like I want to, well, I, uh, I discouraged him and uh, by the next week, he was on to something else anyway, so it really didn't matter, but didn't have the ability to do that. Uh, I don't care if she is a pastor's daughter. If she doesn't have the ability to sing, she doesn't belong on the praise team. So I'm just saying. And then availability. Some people like to do it, have the ability to do it, but don't have the time to do it. And so that availability problem will pose a, a problem for you uh, in that ministry. Reliability, the commitment. No. Scripture says, 1 Corinthians 4, 2, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. It's not just perhaps a nice thing to have. It's not just an option or a suggestion. It is required that that person be found faithful. So once a person makes a commitment, then they, they must be able to execute regardless of what their schedule looks like. Teachability. Teachability is, uh, is paramount. You have to have the temperament yes. to be able to, uh, to be taught. And that includes the, the, uh, the ability, the, the resilience to be corrected. I was sharing this with Brother Woodward, and he said, yes, I would add one th other thing, correctability. Mm -hmm. So teachability uh, incorporates correctability as well. Accountability. Accountability has to do with character. Mm -hmm. Now, you might have somebody that's multi-talented, somebody that is just absolutely phenomenal, and there are times when talent, I hate to use the word trump, but it, talent trumps, trumps ability. Or for, for a, a person who's looking for something, we need talent. We need somebody that can really sing, can play the keyboard, can play the piano. Oh, I wish we had. And so somebody comes along and their character is suspect. And you think, well, now I know that we are, we are attempting to the mature, as uh, Brother Wordward says, has to be, the, the, we have to be flexible and so forth. And, and that is true all other things being equal. But what may not be equal is a person's uh, flawed character. Not their faults, but their, their character. And you can't really move a person into leadership if they don't have good character. And then sociability, which is attitude. Uh, people have to work together. What a great uh, lesson we heard in two uh, parts with Brother Woodward. Have to have the ability to work together. If uh, people get jealous or stubborn uh, and they pull back and say, well, you know, if you don't do it my way, we're not, I'm not going to be involved in this, that's not going to work. And finally, possibility, which is spirituality. Do you have 
the spirituality. These are all things you can kind of read that a little closer, uh, but these are questions that need to be asked of the person. Uh, and then the uh, anticipation of needs and then establishing your priorities. Let's look at your team. Enlist the core of people who will be on your training team. Um, and this is a, a, a step beyond just assembling a team because I believe that we have to, as we grow, as your church, your congregation grows, you have to be willing to assemble a team of trainers. And they, they then have to be uh, uh, charged with the responsibility you need to train people as well. If the pastor or whoever the leader is has to be the star player, then you are creating for yourself a ceiling beyond which you cannot move. You are limiting yourself, uh, and, and uh, you only have 24 hours a day. You only have so much ability to divide your attention and, and pay proper attention to each person. And once you reach your limit, once you max out, you can't go any farther than that. There are some pastors, for example, that very reluctantly and begrudgingly turn their pulpit over to someone else. Somebody else, I've even known pastors, believe it or not, that open the service. They are the song leader, uh, or we called them song leader many years ago. Now it's worship leader. Uh, they take the offering and they preach and they give the altar call and do the counseling and so forth. And they have other people that are capable of doing those things, you don't trust them. You're not going to do the kind of job that needs to be done. I'm the only one. Well, bless your heart, I guess that's what... Uh, at some point, you have reached your limit. Now, some are extremely capable, and they can take a church up to, you know, two, three, four hundred doing it themselves, but they'll never go beyond that. It is so much better when we can delegate and we can help other people uh, achieve their, uh, their God-given goals uh, in their life. Okay, share your burden with your team. If you are a pastor or you are a, a team leader or a ministry leader, uh, don't simply assume that people know what you're feeling or what you're thinking. I believe one of the most important things for a pastor to understand is that his team, his staff, are representative of himself to the rest of the church. And they then become uh, his greatest PR. Uh, anytime someone comes up at, to a staff member, to a team member, and says, what about this or what about that? And that team member has this deer in the headlights look, say, I, I just work here. I mean, I, 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 I really don't. Go ask the pastor. Once that happens, it is bad PR for the pastor and for the leadership and for the church in general. People on your staff, and I believe strongly in this, people on your staff need to know everything that's possible for them to know about the ministry that they're involved in and even beyond because there are a lot of overlaps in the church. Um, let me let me put it this way. Every you know a, a basketball team. Let's five members. So let's we can narrow it down. That's a small enough team. A basketball team is a, a center forward guard, two forwards, two guards, and a center. Do you know that the forwards know what the job the guards are supposed to be doing? Mm -hmm. Do you know that the center understands perfectly what the forwards and what the guards are supposed to do? They're not doing those things, but they know what's going on, what they are supposed to be doing. That means that they are involved as a team. Mm -hmm. Don't say, well, you don't need to know that. This is just for us to know. And just this little core here, this one or, these one or two people that we have. No, everybody needs to know because it then they have buy-in. Then they have this sense of belonging, even though they are not participating in that particular idea. Uh, and then finally, encourage questions. Don't tolerate disagreement. Uh, let me give you a little story. Where are we here? 10, 
10 minutes? Oh, yeah, well, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead with this. I, in the early 90s, I, I had been a pastor for um, maybe eight years, seven or eight years by this time. And so I had my annual board meeting with my uh, deacon board, and I was feeling pretty good. And I said, um, well, okay, brethren, uh, any questions about any of this? Fully anticipating that everybody would just kind of laugh and say, well, we're, we're wrapping this up. Thank God. Let's go eat. Uh, but one man raised his hand and said, yeah, I have a question. I said, sure, brother. Uh, ask away. And he looked at me, hesitated a moment. He said, you sure you want me to ask this question? Sure, yeah, go ahead. And he said, it was not really a question, it's just a statement. He said, the financial uh, report you give, uh, gave us is not worth the paper it's written on. Well, the Lord helped me at that point. And uh, I don't know if my ears were kind of turning red or not, but I felt the, the gaze of all of the board members focused on me. Not on that individual. They were looking at me. And what were they thinking? How's he going to respond to this? What's he going to do? And the Lord helped me, and I said, Well, brother, uh, why don't you explain what you mean? He was a businessman, and he knew finance, and he knew financial reports. And he took us through uh, a number of things to explain why he felt that that report was not truly accurate. And when he did that, our eyes were opened, and we began to see what he was talking about. He was not um, insolent. He was, he was not rebellious. He was genuinely concerned. Now, he may not have presented his side of the case initially in uh, a very uh, nice way, but he, he just simply was being blunt if, if honest. Uh, I should say honest if blunt. And so it opened the door for us. And I'm so glad it happened that way back in the early 90s because that's when a lot of things were being said about the books that preachers and churches were keeping and that there was a lot of fraud and, and so forth. And so we were able to kind of nip that in the bud and we got some corrections going for those financial reports. But it was all because that the Lord helped me to uh, respond to a question, first of all, to permit the question, and then to respond to the question in the right way. So don't cut your team members off or your training people off when they has, have questions and think that they are simply trying to cause trouble. There are people who do cause trouble. But guess what? Everybody kind of knows it. Everybody will roll their eyes and, oh, here we go again. And they won't take that person seriously. So uh, when somebody asks a question, it should be a great opportunity for you to say, this is what we're doing, we're, and, and uh, to explain uh, the, the proper thing and in the proper way. Uh, your trainees, there are some criteria for them. Spirituality, a burden, faithfulness, ability, leadership qualities, loyalty, scholarship, all of these things, depending on what you are asking them to do. If you're asking them to help you with your discipleship program, if you're asking them to help you with your Sunday school or children's education, children's ministry or youth ministry, all of these things, uh, some are weighted a little bit differently depending on the particular area that you're asking them to serve in. But uh, all of these uh, criteria have a place to play, uh, a role to play, and you need to be uh, uh, careful about looking at each one of them and making sure that people measure up. You have to have a system uh, for training, a format for training, 
a, maybe a classroom, a, a round table, uh, uh, projects that you would use, media that you use. So you, you do that and select your curriculum. Uh, the, the old lecture method uh, is, uh, is kind of gone by the boards. It's, it's kind of passe. So uh, there are so many new ways to get material across and you need to uh, take advantage of everything that you possibly can measuring success or measuring progress and rewarding success. This is important to reward success and I have been kind of poor at that over my pastoral career um, and, and I've, I kind of regret a, a lot of that because uh, I do get, I, I am somewhat task oriented although I'm probably more uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, Brother uh, uh, Woodward's uh, analysis more in the relationship camp, but uh, I, I do believe that people need to be recognized and rewarded. It doesn't have to be much, but it has to be some way that you show people, I appreciate you, I love you. If you have kind of this flippant attitude, shrug your shoulders and say, oh, they're just doing their job, just doing what God called you to do. Why should I? Now they may, I would counsel them to say, do what you are called to do and don't wait around for somebody to say thank you. But on your end of the line, as the leader, you need to go beyond, above and beyond the call of duty. You need to say, I appreciate you. I love you. I just want you to know that what you're doing is very, very important. Uh, the job that you uh, ask people to do has to fit the person. Uh, there are, as the scripture says, 30, 60, 100 fold people. Not everybody's going to be uh, a star player. But uh, you then assess that ability and you uh, assign them whatever, whatever job that is commensurate with that responsibility. Let me, let me say this, and this is important. The lesser qualified person needs more specificity in assigning them. Mm -hmm. If they're not really capable, then you have to be very sure that you specify exactly what you want them to do. Yeah. Now, the more qualified person can be given greater latitude. You can allow them to make, uh, at some level, decisions that, uh, that you couldn't allow everybody to make. Uh, let me say this, and I think this is also extremely important. Most failures are not incapable they're only misdiagnosed. Uh, when you ask somebody to do something that they are not equipped to do and they fail at it, sometimes we have a tendency, well, I can't trust that person. They're not, they're not able to do it. It may be a failure of diagnosis. You know, misdiagnosis is a huge problem in the medical field. When someone is, and it happens very often. Some of you may have been misdiagnosed. Uh, one of our pastors uh, in, uh, in Ohio, in our section, was misdiagnosed for several years and he was put on chemotherapy and some other medicines that he never... And one case, and he was able to find... They actually got his records mixed up with another patient and they were treating him uh, what they should have been treating the other patient with some medications and even some procedures. Uh, so be very careful. Don't misdiagnose people. Make sure that the Lord helps you to get on the right page. Uh, then execution, you have to uh, do it. Let me say this. Uh, there are some internships. Uh, don't uh, don't uh, put somebody on the job before their training is complete. Uh, there needs to be some probationary periods. There needs to be some ways to monitor their, uh, their performance, appraisals, and uh, debriefings, submission of plans, and, and so forth, uh, interview. In other words, don't just put somebody on the job and walk away and leave them and think, well, they'll get it. Uh, it's kind of the, uh, and I, I don't want to disparage my, all of my elders, but it is old school to think, well, uh, I'll just give a person a job and uh, they'll, it'll either make or break them. 
you know, and walk away and let them uh, flounder. Don't, don't do that because you're not doing yourself or that person a favor. Right. And they might end up hurting the ministry uh, or that particular ministry in a, in a profound way. So uh, make sure you keep monitoring that. You don't have to breathe down their neck, but you do have to have a way of knowing whether or not they're getting their job done. Um, this is another important thing. Make all assignments term limited with renewal possibilities. Ask somebody to do something for a year and then make, make it well known to them that in one year we're going to come bring you in we're going to talk to you about this and it may be that we're going to move you into some other place uh, or, or somebody else, you need to know this up front so that what happens is that some people may get a hold of a job and think they own it. Right. They think they own that set of drums. They think, think they own that keyboard, uh, et cetera, that they own that Sunday school room and you can't give it to anybody else. Well, you know, you're going to have a lot of problems if that uh, is the feeling. So, Make sure, and let me just say this, not only with the uh, particular assignment to that person, but also with your program. If you have a program in your church that has run out of steam, don't keep trying to push it along and make it happen anyway. If interest falls off, if the whole dynamics change, the context is different, uh, then allow it to die. Now, don't be brutal. Give it a decent burial, a nice funeral. Uh, honor all the people in the past that made it go, but then let it go. Nostalgia is a horrible reason to keep a program going. It needs to be relevant. It needs to be effective. It needs to be what has to be done right now. Uh, and in the near future, that's the only reason that you should keep it going. Uh, so no one should own their job for life. Some do's and don'ts. Do not base assignments on emotional or personality considerations. I don't care if they are the son-in-law or the first cousin of someone who has a job now and you, you just kind of feel obligated to, to, to say, okay, you're the next person for this job. Uh, that should not be a consideration. Don't undertrain or don't overtrain. If somebody's got it, they've 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 grasped it. They know what the what to do, and you keep saying, "Ah, eh, we're not quite ready yet," and you keep training and overtraining. You're going to discourage them. They're not going to want to do it uh, after all. Um, be careful of partnerships based on friendships or, or cliques. Be careful of teams based on blood relationship. Be consistent. Don't treat ca training casually or lightly. More do's and don'ts. Don't lock yourself to a pet format. Others may learn differently. Some people may not, as we said, not uh, really take to a lecture method. They need, uh, they need projects or they need hands-on stuff. They, they need... Uh, uh, things that, that will make a difference in their ability to learn, and everybody's different. Model your assignment. Oh, yes, combine training with assignments. Don't get near the water till you learn to swim. That's what my mother always said. Don't go near the water till you learn to swim. Constantly, I never learned to swim until I, I got in junior high school. But uh, at any rate, uh, you, you need to make sure they train and in a practical way uh, do what you've asked them to do. Model your assignments. Ref refresh your courses. Don't think you've trained a person once and that's it. What are you doing here today? Thank you. You are being refreshed. There are a lot of things that, I, that I've said I know you've heard before and some other people who have talked to you, I know you've heard it in some other way before, but what are you doing? You are getting refreshed. And so, and you recognize the importance of that. That's why you came. And so don't uh, shortchange people in your church, on your team, in your uh, training class. Don't shortchange them by, by saying, you know what, once 
and one and done. We're, we're out of here. Uh, provide for new methods, upgrade technologies, expanded fields and opportunities, and reward victories and progress. And here's, and I put this in bold letters because I really want you to get this. The ultimate success of your work will rise or fall on the quality of your training program. If you are not training people to do what you want them to, what your vision for the church is, or your vision for outreach, uh, then it's going to fall apart. It's going to come apart at the seams. It's going to crumble. You're going to be very disappointed. And the problem with a disappointment in some kind of a program, training program like, program like this, is that it carries over. The emotion of failure carries over, and you will be less likely and more reluctant to do it or to try it again. So make sure that you put the emphasis on training, it will make the difference in your level and measure of success. Praise God. Uh, any questions we, we want you to, if you uh, can, I know that this has not been successful. We try to get people to get into uh, to groups and uh, they've uh, kind of been a little more reluctant to do that. But uh, let me do it this way. If, if anybody has uh, either a, uh, a question for me or maybe a statement or you'd like some, uh, to dispense some wisdom of your own, uh, I would appreciate it. So, and everybody else would as well. Anybody would like to ask a question or make a statement? Yes. Uh, you know what? Uh, 